Well, Oregon program overview did really well, and uh, it is completed, and Oregon fans are in the house. So now it's time to tap into our brothers from the East Coast and get into a little Rutgers football and basketball with their program overview. We are here with Aaron Brightman and my co-host, Sonny Verma. Sonny, how are you doing today? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, I've had Aaron on my other show, Alina Cast, a couple of times, and uh, I know it'll be a treat for everybody. If you're a fan of Rutgers, uh, Aaron's the guy to follow. Yep. Aaron Brightman, he's from the uh, Scarlet Faithful podcast over there. And uh, Aaron, do you want to tell the people about you, where they can find you and stuff like that? Sure. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Um, Aaron underscore Brightman on Twitter. Uh, Scarlet Faithful is on Instagram and uh, YouTube channel and uh, podcast on all the platforms is the Scarlet Faithful. You can search for us there. Thank you so much for joining us first and foremost. And, you know, let's go ahead and get into it. We'll start with football. Um, Rutgers football, you know, their brand and identity is something that I thoroughly enjoy because it is a very physical brand of football, right? It is very New Jersey-esque, right? With that toughness and that physicality. Um, you know, so I guess we'll go ahead and start with last season and just putting a bow on last season, wrapping everything into, you know, what was the overall feel from the fan base from last year's team and and what is the overall mood going into next season? Yeah, great point about the toughness. Uh Greg Schiano is is, you know, had that that's really been his identity in his first tenure at Rutgers, making them relevant and bringing the program to a level of success it never had before, just in terms of annual bowl games and uh, uh having uh, such success there after not having a um much much of a run of success at all prior to him being there uh, for many years. And uh, he's pretty much picked back up where we had hoped he would be. It maybe took a little bit longer than some fans hoped, but obviously transitioning back into the Big Ten uh, and with the roster pretty bare that Chris Ash left uh, when he was ultimately fired. Uh, and then COVID hit, you know, it took a little bit of time for Shiano to build back the roster. Uh, but this past season, uh, really, I think exceeded expectations to the point where uh, they started six and two. A lot of that had to do with the schedule. Um, but, you know, it's not not often that you win all of your winnable games. And that's what Rutgers did this season. Uh, and most in pretty comfortable fashion. Obviously, that Michigan State comeback was pretty uh, uh, significant uh, in late in the game. Um, but otherwise, all of their other wins were pretty comfortable leading up to that. Uh, the Virginia Tech win, uh, most notably, and uh, they, uh, they they just, yeah, they dominated teams with ball control, uh, really good defense, special teams play uh, was a big key to their success. They uh, scored three touchdowns on special teams uh, this past season, and, and in each of those games they did that, they won, including the bowl game over Miami. So there's certainly an identity just in terms of uh, having a chip on their shoulder, uh, and, and a strategy in terms of how Shiano wants to play. Uh, obviously, the offense needs to improve, but the defense took another step forward. And, uh, you know, th there's a strong returning course. So there's certainly more expectation for next year. But uh, I think that this past season, getting back to a bowl game, winning a bowl game for the first time since he's returned, uh, Greg Shiano's second tenure now is kind of on, on schedule. So speaking of this upcoming year, you know, the Scarlet Knights are returning 74% of their uh, production. You know, the offense is returning 10 guys. Defense is returning nine guys. Now, you know, unlike certain fan bases, uh, you know, one particular that my co-host is a part of, like, they love to tell everyone how awesome they're going to be this next year. Like, <laughs> they love to, you know, hey, did you see this offseason, this and that. Rutgers has kind of been the low-key, quiet – you want to go there? <laughs> the low key quiet team that I've been seeing more and more. A lot of you know experts uh, are kind of saying, "Hey, look out for the Scarlet Knights uh, this up upcoming year." You know, I've even seen some people predict them to hit ten wins. I mean, obviously, you're over under. I think that's crazy. Up, yeah, I honestly I was flabbergasted by it. So that you know, this is kind of why I wanted to have this conversation with you. It opened up at five and a half, I believe we said. And I think, uh, Aaron, you mentioned to me that it's gone up to six and a half. You know, six and a half for a Rutgers team, historically, you know, you've got to be very happy with that. But how positive are you feeling 
for uh, this upcoming season next year? Well, I mean, it is true. They have a lot of guys back defensively. Uh, you know, they've, uh, other than Max Melton, who's going to, you know, enter the NFL draft. I mean, they essentially have every other key uh, contributor back. Uh, Flip Dixon, the transfer from Minnesota, was huge for them at safety this year. Uh, you have De- Desmond Ignusen and uh, uh, back as well. Uh, and then, you know, Aaron Lewis and Wesley Bailey uh, up front, uh, two of their best guys. Mo Ture is going to be back. So, so many big names on offense. Tyreen Powell is going to be back from injury. Uh, so defensively, they really are uh, set in terms of uh, their experience and and their, their starters are essentially all there. So I think the big challenge for the defense next year, it's going to be interesting to see with these Pac-12 schools coming in. Uh, you know, Rutgers did not face a lot of pass heavy offenses last year. And when they did, they did tend to struggle a little bit. Uh, even, you know, Iowa had, I think, their best passing game of the season against Rutgers. Maryland really tore them up down the stretch uh, in that last game. So that's going to be an adjustment, I think. Can they take another step forward? Uh, and then offensively, obviously, they had their struggles, but your offensive line is pretty much uh, entirely back. Kyle Manungai, obviously, who led the Big Ten in rushing, is going to be back. Uh, finding uh, playmakers in the receiving core and solidifying the quarterback position are going to be very huge. Uh, obviously, Ethan Calic Manis from Minnesota has transferred in, will compete with Gavin Wimsett. Uh, you have uh, a FCS All American Demir Hill from uh, Monmouth who's transferred in. Uh, so he has, uh, excuse me, Demir Miller. So he has a chance to, to really be an impact as well. The other thing with the schedule is now that the Big East, uh, Big Ten East is no longer, uh, there's a first time that Rutgers is going to go through a Big Ten season without having to play Michigan, Penn State, or Ohio State. So the key difference for me in in last season versus this season is they don't have any surefire losses on the schedule, I don't think, other than probably you could say fairly at USC. You know, I I don't see that. But other than that – it's fair to look at every other game on that schedule as a winnable game or a matchup type game uh, where this past year, uh, you know, and in previous years, they've always had three or four, maybe even five at times games on the, on the schedule where you can just kind of pencil on the loss before the season. So that's another reason for optimism aside from just what they're returning and the experience they have back is that the schedule certainly opens up. Now they're, they were in, you know, if they're in some close games, it's very rare that you win all your winnable games. But I think that there is a lot of opportunity uh, in, on the schedule for 2024. You can tell the Big Ten really uh, felt bad for you guys uh, being in the <laughs> East all, this year, all these years. You get to avoid Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, and Oregon. You know, so, you know, yeah. i very fortunate in that end, absolutely. Well, the funny the funny part was uh, before they added uh, Washington, and Oregon, they, when they you know they put out that initial schedule for next year, and they gave Rutgers every Big Ten East school other than Indiana. Yep. So <laughs> at that point, we were like, "What's going on?" And then then they completely redid the schedules with the two more Pac-12, and they yeah they, they got a much more favorable schedule. So uh, yeah, certainly cause for optimism. Speaking of the the Big Ten, you know where does Rutgers fit? in the current, you know, modern landscape of college football where it's kind of keeping up with the Joneses, right? And the NIL, you know, it's who has the most money, who can lure this player because of this reason, X, Y, you know, that and third. Where does Rutgers fall into that? And what do you think is going to be the biggest struggle in the modern college football world with with uh, where everything stands? And what do you think is something that is unique about Rutgers that could give them somewhat of an advantage over some of the other schools? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, you know, Shiano has really preached that they are a developmental program. Part of that is out of necessity. Uh, They do have NIL. Uh, There are two collectives, and uh, I think they've done a a decent job. You know, in terms of retention, uh, it's been an amazing offseason. All their key contributors, all their senior starters are coming back. You know, no one transferred out for bigger offers elsewhere. So that's been really big. But just in terms of, you know, they are limited in terms of the, the ceiling of, of guys they can go and get in the portal due to NIL. So that is a factor. Um, recruiting has uh, kind of steadily improved. I think just in terms of where they fit in the Big Ten, you're seeing now Rutgers have kind of a uh, more geographical footprint within the Big Ten from a recruiting perspective that they haven't had before. 
Shiano obviously being at Ohio State prior to Rutgers, you know, they get, they've gone into Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin. They're starting to get some higher end recruits from there that they never have previously. So that helps. They've always dipped into Florida, uh, you know, it, even in Shiano's first tenure. They're having more success there now. And obviously just beating Miami helps as well. Yeah. So I think from a recruiting perspective, uh, you know, it, it's it's. It's going to be, they've always been about finding guys that they can, uh, you know, it hasn't been about necessarily recruiting rankings per se, but guys that Shiano really likes and fits within the culture. Uh, you know, they, they like versatile guys that they that can kind of uh, develop in the system and, and find different positions defensively, particularly. Uh, but they're going to have to elevate that offense. But I think in terms of fitting within the Big Ten, um, you know, identity wise, I think they fit. They're, they're a Big Ten West team in terms of identity. Yeah. Uh, you know, run the ball, control the clock. Uh, you know, strong defense, and uh, you know, win twenty to seventeen. That's what Rutgers wants to do. They're not really built for shootouts. Uh, they're not built for you know coming from behind by multiple scores. Uh, hopefully, that could change over time. But I think that Shiano's philosophy is pretty clear in how he wants. Uh, you know, the, the he called the complementary football talks about it all the time. Uh, but I think that, you know, brand wise, I, I think they, they brought they're now at a respectable level. Mm -hmm. I think they're starting to, to grow recognition within the Big Ten landscape. And you're seeing that uh, in the recruiting side of it as well. For, for what it's worth, Sonny, just real quick, for what it's worth, I did do my schedule prediction for Nebraska. Rutgers was our first loss on the schedule. So I had us going wow. five and oh, we have an easy first six games. 5-0, and I had her first loss to Rutgers, for what it's worth. So I do respect the Rutgers team. I, I do agree that y'all are on the up, and I think I think the best is yet to come from Rutgers. But uh, go ahead, Sonny. Now, saying, you know, the best is yet to come for Rutgers, you know, that's – it's a thing that really was never said until Shiano got there for when, when it came to the first stint and now the second stint. What is it that he does in particular that he's figured out about the Rutgers job that makes him, like – not even relatively successful, just incredibly successful compared to pretty much anyone else who's uh, held that post over the last couple decades. Yeah, well, I mean, we touched on it earlier, but he's a Jersey guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he has the respect and uh, the, the relationships within the state. Uh, recruiting has, you know, always been a little bit of a, a uphill battle with, you know, the Blue Bloods have always come into the state. And typically taking the best players, but you know, slowly but surely, Shiano's winning some battles, uh, and, and he's done a really good job. But he, he's really good at finding those three-star recruits within the state that he can develop. Uh, and um, you know, just locally in terms of New York State, he's always gotten the best recruits there. But I think it's just identity. You know, he he he's a great motivator. Uh, players really buy into his culture and what he is selling in terms of. Uh, you know, be being able to be a difference maker at Rutgers, you know, coming to Rutgers and being remembered uh, in a way that, you know, if you go to some of these other programs, you're, you're, you're going to be just kind of another cog in the in the yep. wheel uh, where you can make a true difference at Rutgers and, you know, be a hero long term if they have uh, unprecedented success. Uh, you know, he's uh, he's done a really good job at selling that vision uh, and just getting getting everyone to buy in and and, and believe in that. So. Uh, he, he really is. And he's also he's, he's a great game preparation manager. Uh, you know, he, he's been criticized over the years at times for, you know, X's and O's in the middle of games. But uh, there's kind of a saying, you know, if you give him a, a, you know, at the start of the season and in bowl season, if you give him multiple weeks off uh, to prepare for a team uh, more times than not, uh, he, he'll Rutgers is, is the better team on the field. And you saw that in the bowl game. You saw that week one, obviously, Northwestern had it had a disadvantage but even virginia tech early on you know when these teams were still kind of finding their their footing uh rutgers was the more prepared team and they were able to dominate in a way that perhaps if they played some of those teams later in the season they would not have um but shiano is just great at game preparation and and having his players prepared for adversity and being able to, to fight through it the the mantra of you know chop, chop the moment uh they, they really all believe it for sure and I guess, you know, a couple of just more questions to wrap it up on the football side of things. But, you know, coming off of last season, what do you think are the biggest issues that plagued last year's team? You know, because even the Michigan game where y'all were in it in the first half, you know, damn near deadlocked at, at halftime. Michigan pulled away in the second half. You know, so what are the things that you think 
kind of held y'all back in those games? And do you think there's a potential that y'all could start to pull some of those upsets, you know, maybe next year and in, in the years in the future? Yeah, I mean, uh, the Michigan game, Wisconsin game, and Ohio State game, they had pick sixes when they were, you know, within striking distance of all three. Uh, it's really consistency at the quarterback position. It's not mm-hmm. – Really not more fancy than that, I don't think. The offensive line play definitely has to improve. They need more playmakers in the passing game and the wide receiving core. But ultimately, they need more accuracy out of their quarterback. Gavin Wims, you know, at times uh, was, you know, made some tremendous throws. But uh, overall, he was very inconsistent, uh, you know, it, with his accuracy. Missed a lot of, of, of passes that, you know, really would have just kept drives going that he wasn't able to complete. Uh, I love his his ability as a dual threat quarter, uh, and you know he, he's as as pure of a runner as a quarterback they've ever had. Um, but just you know being able to complete some some five to ten yard passes at a more uh, much higher uh, clip would go a long way towards the offense being more consistent. So they bring in Cali Manis, who, who did struggle a little bit at Minnesota, but you know he he thrived under uh, offensive coordinator Kirk Shiraka at Minnesota two years ago. Uh, so I think it's a good move, and I think you know competition is only a positive. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see what happens. I, I think Wimsey, you know, he has a lot of raw tools. Can they uh, get him to kind of hone them and and improve his accuracy? That will be key. But I think next season and beyond, uh, can they get consistent uh, quarterback play uh, that can get that offense? I mean, even if their offense is just average, uh, mm-hmm. they they would be hard to beat just with how solid they are defensively and on special teams. Absolutely. So what would you say for 2024 your ceiling is and your the floor is for this team? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, honestly, I, I was saying this on, on my own podcast today. I was going through the win projections and uh, I, I could see anywhere from honestly four to eight to eight to four. I think that they certainly could. Uh, there's just a lot of toss up games on the schedule uh, more so than last year, which is a positive but I don't see any surefire wins more more than there were last year. You have uh, Akron and Howard to start the year. And then after that, you know, I, I think there's a lot of winnable games out there, but none that you look at. Like I was looking at how many games I think Rutgers would be favored in. I think they're only going to be favored in, as of right now, probably five, maybe six games. Uh, so if you look at it from that perspective uh, and winning six games last year, I, I – I'm a big believer in that, you know, just because you don't necessarily go forward, you know, I, I could see very easily they could go back a couple games in the record and not be a worse team just in terms of how close some of these games might be. Uh, so I think getting back to six wins is is huge. Uh, and anything after that, I think, would be a, a huge positive. But I, I definitely think they could get up to that eight uh, win mark, but uh, it wouldn't shock me if they lost some close games and they, you know, fell back a little bit and had actually a losing record too. I was pulling up our, our power rankings here for reference. Uh, me and Sunday did a power rankings episode. So um, just looking at where we had them, um, you can see who you agree with probably going to be me. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I had Rutgers uh, 13, Sonny, you had them. Oh, nine. So he's probably going to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, without, without looking at the list, I mean, I, I would, I would, I would probably pick somewhere in between that. You know, maybe like eleven ish. Um, I, I again, I think they have the potential to be in that top half. I think they can win eight games. Uh, you know, some fans have delusions of even better than that. But I again, I think this year they were very fortunate in that they won every winnable game they had on the schedule, and that just doesn't happen year after year. So uh, well, while they might have nine or ten winnable games next season. Um, you know, if they can win six of them and then uh, win those two games to start the season, then there you go. But, okay, I see what you're doing. So Rutgers, yeah, Maryland, UCLA, Rutgers, Michigan State. I'd probably drop Rutgers now, the, uh, UCLA now. So what's interesting is that all those teams you have behind Rutgers, those are all in Rutgers' schedule next season other than Indiana. Yep. So I got them winning those games. Interesting. Yeah. But, you know, again, some of those games could go, you know, back and forth and, and yeah. some of those were on the road. And uh, so, yeah. Just was just was curious. You're I always like to bring up the power rankings and and, and talk a little bit because Sonny, Sonny chirps over there. But we'll go ahead and move over to basketball. And, you know, Sonny, I, you know, 
more a little bit about kind of the recruiting. You've talked to me about their their recruiting class this year. So can you go into the big time recruits for the basketball team and kind of what that means to them and, and go from there? Uh, we could, but let's talk up. Just start off talking about the season that they're having right now, um, just because, you know, they struggled right off the bat. Obviously, Aaron, uh, you and I have kind of talked a little bit about this. Uh, you've got what I consider one of the best coaches, uh, not just in the conference, but in the country. And now you've won four out of five games. Uh, you know, obviously, a lot of that has to do with the emergence of uh, Jeremiah Williams. Tell me what he's kind of done to the team itself that has made Rutgers kind of elevate their play uh, since his arrival. Yeah, I mean, the the Rutgers offense really struggled uh, not having a, a natural point guard. Uh, they obviously were hurt, you know, with Paul Mulcahy and Cam Spencer. They're, they're starting backcourt, transferring out late in last offseason, uh, May and June. And, um, you know, the hope was that someone like Derek Simpson could step up and kind of be the, the, the playmaker on offense. And he has at times, but, you know, now that Jeremiah Williams is there, he's a, a veteran, uh, you know, hand. Uh, Simpson kind of has some pressure off of him. He's played better. But Jeremiah is just someone that can, you know, he can get downhill at will. Uh, he's a very unselfish passer. He's really opened things up uh, in terms of Cliff Omori down low, uh, getting getting open in space. Uh, their spacing as a half-court offense is much better now. Uh, and they're just, uh, they, they have an identity on offense that they really were lost uh, previously. They were, they were forcing a lot of contested jumpers. Uh, and now they're just, you know, able to get to the rim more, uh, able to find, uh, you know, better shot selection uh, with their passing. They're moving the ball better. Uh, and it just gives them confidence. And uh, they're talking more, they're more connected defensively. They were good defensively before, but I think he's added a, a kind of a, a, another level of, of uh, for the defense. And, um, you know, they're just very cohesive on the court. It's like they were missing that one piece of the puzzle, and now everything fits. Everyone's in a little bit of a different role that fits them better. Uh, and it's, uh, it's definitely uh, given some hope that they could finish this season uh, on a very positive note. And for you, what is a positive note? Like, uh, obviously, that loss to Minnesota, you know, may have kind of dashed their chances to make the NCAA tournament. Or do you disagree? Do you think there that uh, possibility still remains that they make the big tournament? Uh, there's definitely a chance. I mean, they're at Purdue on Thursday night. So that's kind of a golden ticket. That would be, I, I think, probably, I mean, Purdue and UConn, even though Purdue's not number two in it, I think they're the best two teams. And neither of them have lost at home this year. So if you win at Purdue, which Rutgers did do last season uh, and and has done uh, twice now in the last four or five years, uh, that would be the best win, I think, in college basketball, arguably at least. So uh, that would be, I think, a huge resume booster. They have three games at home against teams, uh, two that they've already beaten in Michigan and Maryland. They have Ohio State this season uh, for senior day. Uh, and then you're on the road at Nebraska and Wisconsin, uh, not easy places to play, but two teams they beat already as well. So, you know, listen, if they can go five and one down the stretch, including a win at Purdue, I, I think that they'll be right there. But even if they don't, I think, you know, if they can get to 10 wins uh, regular season in Big Ten play, they'd actually be coming into the year. There's only four teams that have won 10 or more regular season Big Ten games the last four seasons. Illinois, uh, Iowa, Michigan, and Rutgers. So if they could do it again this year, uh, I, you know, Michigan's obviously going to fall off of that. It just brings a certain level of consistency uh, of success to the program. Uh, and, and even if they fall short of an NCAA tournament, I think that assures them an NIT bid. And with how the season was going, I think that that's still a positive. Uh, and you're going to get, you know, more time with guys that are going to be contributors next season, uh, or we hope. So I, I think that would that would be a positive note to end on for sure. But yeah, it I do think it's still possible to make the NCAA tournament. Obviously, it's a huge climb to, to go. But this is also a program that two years ago was left for dead, and they had that uh, you know made college basketball history four consecutive wins against ranked teams as an unranked opponent, and they snuck in. So you never know. And then last year they kind of were the last team left out. So we're hoping maybe a complete turnaround this year. We'll see. Now we're talking about the Rutgers bubble potential. Now, do you think the play of Jeremiah Williams will factor into the committee's 
decision to put them in potentially if if it comes down to you know let's say they do beat a purdue and then they do finish on a, on a pretty decent stretch and they're right there as a bubble team do you think that 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 factors in and do you think that's enough to kind of push them over the threshold potentially i mean i i hope so uh you know last year we were kind of tired of hearing about uh, the difference with Moat Mag being out with his injury and the NCAA committee kind of coming out and, and saying that that was a big difference maker in the decision. Rutgers finished three and eight down the stretch after he got injured. Uh, so you would think that it would be fair to then count it as a positive this year. I kind of feel like, though, honestly, that it, it will kind of work itself out. Like if they win enough games with Jeremiah Williams, I still think their overall resume will be strong enough. Um, but yes, if it's, it's all going to depend, I think how soft the bubble is. Yep. Um, if, if, if you would like to think that, you know, if all things being equal, uh, that maybe that could be a tiebreaker for them knowing that, you know, they didn't have him for most of the year and then they yep. played so well with him, but, uh, it's good. You know, I, it's, it's impossible to predict what the NCAA committee does. I do think there's some conference politics there too. I think Penn state getting on such a run at the end of last year, kind of hurt Rutgers. Because uh, they would have been the tenth team to make the NCAA tournament, and I think that that's pretty rare for a conference to get that many teams. So that was part of it too. So uh, we'll see. But yeah, I think it certainly can't hurt, and uh, I think it should be a, a positive factor in the resume. Let's turning the attention towards next year, where a lot of Rutgers fans are very excited and deservedly so. Uh, you know, for those not paying attention to basketball recruiting, they've got. Two of the top three uh, recruits in the country next year coming into uh, Rutgers and Dylan Harper and Ace Bailey. Now, when you think of two of the top three recruits signing on to a program, you think, oh, it must be Kentucky. It must be Duke. It must be North Carolina. In this case, it's Rutgers. Tell me, what is Peichel doing out there that <laughs> he's able to attract not just good talent, but the elite of elite talent? Yeah, well, Dylan Harper's, you know, uh, pretty logical in the sense of I've had a relationship with his family for many years now. Obviously, his older brother, Ron Harper Jr., played at Rutgers, uh, did not have had one other division or, or high major offer uh, at a high school in Nebraska, actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, Jersey kid and uh, developed, obviously, uh, very well under Peichel. Uh, it's been in the G League the last two years. So he's had that relationship with the family. And uh, that that went a long way. I mean, they've been recruiting Dylan since the seventh or eighth grade. Uh, and um, I think that that comfort level for him and with the family and just their trust in Peichel, uh is, is a big part of it. You know, he went to uh, Hungary with, during the, the FIBA U-19 uh, World Cup last year uh, to see him play. He's, he's, he's been, um, you know, his top priority for years now. Uh, and I think, you know, there's just a buy-in in terms of, of the benefits that he'll get for playing for a coach like Michael that, you know, they completely trust. Then with Ace Bailey, you know, there is a relationship there with assistant coach Brandon Knight, uh, who's been with the program since Michael has, uh, you know, been at Rutgers. And uh, I think, again, I think it's trust, um, you know, and, and they've been on him a long time. Him and Dylan Harper are really good friends now playing with each other, you know, in all these all-star events and throughout their, kind of uh, junior year and, and, and summer. And I think they, they both kind of have a mentality of they, they, I mean, they obviously could have gone anywhere. Right. So they, they, they like the idea of going to Rutgers and, and, and being remembered forever, even if, because they're going to play, you know, most likely if things work out, they're one and done players. They're, they're both projected to be in the NBA uh, draft lottery. So I, I think that they both are at a very young age, cognizant of kind of, Maybe not their legacy, but but what their what it could mean to come to Rutgers and have unprecedented success. So I think that's a motivating factor. But I think at the end of the day, they trust Michael and uh, they they feel like they'll, they'll be able to develop there. Uh, he's he had a really good um, just you know track record of developing players. This would be a whole nother level for him as a coach. But it's it's certainly exciting, and uh, you know not only that, but they have Leighton Somerville as a top 100 recruit. Uh, two other three-star wings, so they have a top ten class. Uh, it's going to be the highest, you know, rated recruiting class in program history, and uh, it's just uh, it's been, you know, obviously created a lot of energy and excitement for next year. Yep. So, you know, I guess, Sonny, do you have any more questions before I ask this this final question? Because I was going to have a little fun with this last one. Uh, 
No, I, th- I think I'm done. I guess, Aaron, I just want to kind of ask you, you know, Rutgers has been in the Big Ten now for, you know, a, a good amount of years. Like, how would you say, do you feel at home yet? Like, you know, whether the programs, yourself, like, do you feel like you guys have kind of like caught up to everything like the conference has been doing? Or do you still kind of feel like you've been lagging in any sort of way? Yeah, I think, you know, when they came into the Big Ten, I I think that a lot of fan bases didn't really realize how far behind Rutgers was and kind of ill-prepared. You know, they were way behind facilities-wise. They were way behind fundraising-wise. You know, the Big East was competitive. They they were relatively competitive in the Big East. Um, But, you know, you had... You know, Greg Schiano leave right uh, right before they got brought into the Big Ten. You had their athletic director, Tim Pernetti, was fired right before after the Mike Rice coaching scandal and the basketball program. They were through turmoil. So they entered the Big Ten in a, in a really shaky spot. And it's literally taken about a decade for them to get footing. Um, you know, Pat Hobbs, their athletic director, has done a great job at, at upgrading uh, facilities, upgrading the Olympic sports. He's hired a lot of coaches that have had success. Um, and they're just a lot more cohesion within the athletic department and with the university. The new president, you know, believes in athletics. Uh, and, and there's there's um, some uh, – they're synced in a way, you know, administratively they never have been. So uh, I, I think the best is yet to come. I think the first decade – uh, it's taken a long time for Rutgers to kind of get to the level of a Big Ten program, but I think they're getting there uh, in in pretty much all respects, and it's just going to take a little bit more. Uh, but I think that yes, that they're, they're I, I'm excited for what the next decade will bring because I think they will have more success uh, in in those big sports and other sports as well. Uh, you know, and that's why I laugh at the Stuart. I can't get over the Stuart Mandel article before the year where he said the worst realignment decision ever was Rutgers to the Big Ten and. You know, every school in the Big Ten's profited from Rutgers and Maryland joining from a TV rights. And Rutgers has certainly benefited because even if you just look at football, going back for a second, you know, they, they've played f- four former Big East foes in the last three years that mm-hmm. used to regularly beat them. And that was Boston College, Virginia Tech, uh, Miami and Syracuse. And all those teams used to give Rutgers a hard time in the Big East. And Rutgers is 4-0 against them in the last three years. So I think it's an example of, these schools went to the ACC. Rutgers has gone to the Big Ten. While they have struggled at times, uh, they're still a better program than they ever were before, and they're beating up on these programs that used to beat them all the time. So I, I think it's been a, a, a great uh, development for the for the program, for the state, for the fan base, and I, I do think the best is yet to come. Yeah, to your point, yeah, when, when Rutgers came into the Big Ten, nobody knew how they were going to remotely find a footing in this conference or compete. But yeah, to your point, it's just, it's been tremendous what they've been able to do. And, 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 you know, a, a genuinely not too terribly long. It hasn't been too terribly long that they've been on this rise. So um, exciting stuff, you know, and like I said, I love the brand of, of football Rutgers plays. Uh, Sonny's more of a basketball guy, I'm more of a football guy, but uh, let's go ahead and just, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it off here. I'll pull up these standings here. So what big 10 teams do you think, do end up uh, making the the tournament at the end of the year. Who all gets in? Who do you think maybe gets the top four seeds? Yeah, I mean, Purdue Purdue's obviously in good shape for a one seed. I think Illinois, uh, despite that loss to Penn State, uh, is still in line for a top four seed. I, I, I do think that they, they, they can make a Sweet 16 run. I, I, I think their top eight rotation is really good. Uh, they're super athletic. They're, they're, you know, really tough, I think, to defend. Um, you know, Wisconsin has kind of been up and down. They've been down lately, but I think they'll probably be, I don't know, right now maybe like a, a five or six seed. Uh, and then Michigan State's an enigma like they have been the last couple of years. Obviously a lot of talent on that team, uh, but I think, you know, will they get somewhere between a seven and a ten maybe? I think it depends how they finish. But they're the type of team that it's almost like their seeding doesn't matter. They have enough talent, and obviously with Izzo, they could, I mean, they could make a Final Four run, I feel like, from any seed that they're at. It's just a matter if they get their act together. And then, you know, Nebraska, now Iowa, those, those are really interesting cases. It's funny because if you look at Nebraska's resume, it's really not that much different than Rutgers. They mm-hmm. both have six quad one, quad two wins. Uh, I think Rutgers even has more road wins. So uh, they, they but, better that we can't win on the road. <laughs> so, uh, but but yeah, I, I listen, I, I like Nebraska. They're an exciting team. And uh, I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
They have shooters, right? So they could they could get hot in March and certainly make a run. But I, I just hope whoever does make it for the Big Ten, they have more success as a conference uh, yeah. and get a, get a couple teams at least into the Sweet 16. Uh, it's been disappointing the last two years to see the conference kind of flame out that first weekend. Um, but, yeah, I think it's pretty clear cut. I mean, maybe Minnesota can make a run, maybe Rutgers. Uh, but it's not looking good, for, you know, in terms of the depth of the league that we've seen the last few yeah. years. Uh, in terms of getting, you know, eight, nine bids. So Rutgers, you're not you're not going to call it that they're getting in just yet? Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. I, I, I would love to see it. But, you know, the other thing that I don't have confidence in is the Big Ten tournament, simply because I, I don't know how much weight the committee actually puts on it. Uh, you know, we felt like last year Rutgers, the way they performed in the Big Ten tournament, you know, kind of helped boost their resume, and it kind of turned out it didn't matter. Yeah. So I'm a little skeptical of if you can count on that. So I, I think it's figure. really do have to look at how they finish the regular season. But yeah, if they go five and one, I, I think that they, they're, uh, you know, I think they, they should make it. Um, but that's, you know, that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, I, I can, for the life of me, not figure out college football uh, or college basketball rankings and all of these net and all of these different <laughs> rankings and metrics and none of them make sense compared to the the then one next to it and so yeah it's, it's just at all like trying to figure out what they may pay attention to and all this stuff it's just a uphill battle uh from what i'm finding out so um sunny anything else before we can go go to close out the show no, uh, like I was saying, uh, if you have any interest in Rutgers athletics at all, uh, yep. look no further than Aaron. Aaron produces top quality uh, content uh, almost on a daily basis at this point. I feel like every time my, my YouTube uh, feed is refreshed, uh, there's a new video. And it's not just a video. It's a high quality video. He goes very in depth yep. uh, with his thoughts. So, uh, Aaron, I just want to thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. And, you know, obviously... Uh, this type of show that we're doing here at Big Ten Show, we're trying to balance the insanely popular teams with the teams that uh, people may not be paying to paying as much attention. And, and so Rutgers fans, you know, if you enjoyed this content, if you want us to make more content about Rutgers, please like hit that subscribe button. Show us that you guys are there like the Oregon fans have shown us in their video. The Purdue fans have shown us in their video. So please like and subscribe. And Aaron, again, once again, just thank you so much for coming on today. Yep. yep. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I was, uh, for the for the record, I was uh, under the weather today and running late for the recording, and Aaron's been patient. So, again, thank you so much. And, yeah, get over there and support him. So, But that'll do it for us here on the Big Ten Show. Again, Rutgers edition. We are trying to show love everywhere. So if you like what we're doing here, please consider liking and subscribing. And, uh, you know, we'll see you in the next episode. So peace.